put Khan's arm around my waist so I could raise both hands to the sun, as if an extra 20 inches of extended arm was going to make a big difference to its curative properties. I didn't care. I helped them palm up till I saw Pap's car coming toward us, and Khan handed me carefully into the back seat and slid in after me. I curled up and pretended to go to sleep on Khan's shoulder so we didn't have to make conversation and Pat wouldn't try. This really was pretense. I couldn't go to sleep, at least not yet, and was afraid to try. Even keeping my eyes closed was an effort, but I listened intently to all the normal noises of morning in the city, smelled gas fumes and early coffee bars, and felt Khan's arm around me and his spiky hair occasionally brushing my face and managed to keep the sights of the night before from replaying themselves against my eyelids. The smell of coffee penetrating even through the smell of us reminded me of Charlie's and there was one of those weird bits of mental slippage that trauma produces. I thought, oh, what a good thing I'm not dead. I never did write that recipe down for Polly. It felt like a long drive, although it wasn't, still well before rush hour and in a real car instead of the wreck. Check in as soon as you can, was all Pat said when he dropped us off. Thanks, I said. Thank you, said Con. Again, that flick of gaze to one than the other of us. Yes, yeah, said Pat, and drove away. I had avoided losing my house key by not taking it with me. I fished it out from under the pot of pansies and the crack in the porch floor, and opened the door, half watching my hands still, as if they might turn on me and try to tear my own heart out. Con followed me up the dark stairs. My apartment was full of roses. I'd forgotten about the roses. None of them was more than half open. It felt like some kind of miracle. It felt like centuries since I bought them two days ago. I was supposed to be dead. I would be going to work tomorrow. Cinnamon rolls, roses, they were from another world, the human world. I glanced at my hands again, hands that earn my living making human food. There isn't much that is a lot more nakedly hands-on than kneading dough. The wood wrapped around the length of the balcony railing had a big charred hole in the middle of it. When we'd walked through it last night, into other space presumably, the poor thing, it had probably felt like a garage mechanic presented with a lame elephant. Wait just a sec here. I never said I did all forms of transport. It had been a good ward, and it had survived my smoke-borne passage on my way to find Khan. I'd find out later if it could be patched up or if it was blown or squashed for good. I left Khan in the middle of the shadowy floor and went out into the daylight again, holding my hands out in front of me like sacrifices or discards. Khan moved forward till he was standing at the edge of the shadow. There is nothing wrong with your hands, he said. I shook my head, but I lowered my hands till they rested on the balcony railing. There were scorch marks on the railing. On their backs, with the fingers curled up, my hands looked dead. Tell me, he said. I had to touch him, I said in a low voice. I tried not to, but he was too strong. He was winning. I put my hands. I touched him, though. As I said it, all the other things I was trying not to remember about the night before came racing back, bludgeoning their way into my mind. I felt myself begin to fragment again. When I'd been facing the goddess, I'd known what I was doing for a little while. Now that there was no immediate threat to organize myself around, I shivered even in the daylight. Thin, cool autumn sunlight with winter to come with its shorter, colder days before the baking heat of summer returned. Autumn daylight wasn't going to heal my hands. Or the reopened wound on my breast. I hadn't had to look at it yet, except its reappearance yet, while all of me was covered with crusted blood. Sunshine, said Khan gently. He had no power to hurt you physically. He had had no such power for many years. His strength was in his will, and in the physical strength of those he controlled by his will. If his creatures, his acolytes, had not hurt you, he could not. I wanted to say he did hurt me. His creatures did hurt me. They taught me what I could do. I would never have done what I did to Bo if I had not already done it to his followers. He almost killed me, I said at last, aloud, feebly. This was an unendur unendurably anticlimactic way of describing what had happened. Merely dying seemed like a minor difficulty, like an alarm clock that had failed to go off or a car that wouldn't start. Maybe I had been hanging out with vampires too much. Yes, by sheer force of evil, only that. Only that, I said, only that, yes. 
I turned my head to look at him, leaving my hands awkwardly where they were. The Mr. Connor of the goddess's office had gone. My con was back. There was a vampire in the room. He looked tired, almost as a human might look tired, as well as ragged and filthy. My vampire looked tired. I took my hands off the railing so I could go back into the shadows to con. I reached out to touch him, twisted my hands away from him at the last moment. But he took my hands by the wrist and kissed the back of each fist, turned them over and waited patiently till the fingers relaxed and kissed each palm. It was a strange sensation. It felt less like being kissed than it felt like a doctor applying a salve or a priest's last rites. There is nothing wrong with your hands, he said. The touch of evil poisons by the idea of it. Reject the idea and you have rejected the evil. I was being lectured in morality by a vampire. I wanted to laugh. The problem was that he was wrong. If he'd been right, maybe I could have laughed. My hands feel they've been changed. I can feel this. They, they don't belong to me anymore. They're only attached. They feel as if they maybe have become evil. Bo's evil was a very powerful idea. I thought I was coming to pieces. I'm not sure I'm not. My hands, my hands are two fragments of what is left of me. Two ruined fragments. There was a pause. Yes, said Khan. How do you know? I whispered. I waited for him to drop my hands, to move away from me. The pleading whine of my voice set my own teeth on edge. He was only still with me because the sun trapped him here till sunset. He didn't move away. He said, I see it in your eyes. This was so unexpected, I gaped at him. What? No, I cannot read your secrets, but I can read your fears. My kind are adept at reading fear, and you look into my eyes as no other human ever has. I looked away from him. War and peace, my fears. All 50-odd volumes of the Blood Lore series, the complete Globenet directory. For sheer length and inclusiveness, my fears were right up there. I hoped he was a speed reader. He dropped my hands then, but only to put a finger under my chin. Look at me. I let him raise my chin. Hey, he was a vampire. He could break my neck if he wanted to. This way he didn't have to. You're not afraid of everything, he said. Nearly, I said. I'm afraid of you. I'm afraid of me. Yes, he said. There was a curious comfort in that yes. I had definitely been hanging out with vampires too long, this vampire. I remembered standing in the sunlight in my kitchen window the morning after my return from the lake, that moment when I first began to feel I might recover from whatever it was that had happened. The splinters that my peace of mind had been smashed into, if not perhaps after all my sanity, were sending little scouting filaments across the gaps, looking for other pieces, whether I'd sent them out to look or not. Where the scout filaments met, they'd start winding themselves together again, knitting themselves back into rows. They were probably building on those first granny knots from when I'd agreed to be let out of the SOF bind and be responsible for my behavior. Now, from the first granny knots of the morning after Con had brought me home from the lake, I was going to have some more scars, and the texture of the final weave was going to change, was changing. It was going to be lumpier, and there were going to be some pretty weird holes. I never had been able to learn to knit. I don't do uniformity and consistency. Even my cinnamon rolls tend to have individual personality. I could probably cope with a few more wadgy bits in my own makeup. Maybe my medulla oblongata was refusing to take any crap from my cerebrum again. Shut up and get on with the reconstruction. If you can't find the right piece, use the wrong one. I took a step backward, still facing Han, still within reach of him, but so that the sunlight touched me. There was something struggling out of the murk here, trying to make me think it. If good is going to triumph over evil, good has to stay sane. Say what? Oh, please. I'm still thinking about breathing. Now I'm supposed to start and flogging myself too. <laughs> Go on fighting for the forces of, well, good is some freaking mouthful. It sounds like some Anglo-Saxon geek with a big square jaw and a blazing sword, any vestigial sense of humor, surgically removed years before when he was conditionally accepted to hero school. 
But that was kind of where I wound up, even if I'd missed out on the jaw and the training, because I was definitely against evil, definitely, in my lumpy, erratic way. And I knew what I was talking about, because I'd now met evil. That was precisely the point. I'd touched it. And I was going to have to remember for the rest of my life that I'd touched it, that these hands had grasped, pulled. But us anti-evil guys have to stay sane, lumpy and holy maybe, but sane. Listen, sunshine, Bo was gone. He wasn't going to get the last word now, I hoped. At least not until later this morning. I'm going to run a bath. I'll flip you for who goes first. I had a jar on my desk next to the balcony that helped loose change. Flip vampires. They don't know anything. I won. I was almost sorry. I felt obliged to have only one bath and a fast one, but I made it count. If I rubbed my palms a little raw than I needed to for an idea, at least my hands felt like my hands while I was doing it. Perhaps the touch of the rose petals when I'd had to move all the floating roses out of the bath so I could get me into it instead had helped. There was no wound on my breast. I hadn't believed it at first. I kept rubbing the soap all over my front from Froke's pubic line as if maybe I'd mislaid it somehow. But it wasn't there. The scar was. I thought it looked a little wider, shinier than it had the day after Con had closed it the first time, but it was a scar. But my chain was gone too, and there was a new scar which dipped over the old one in the shape of a chain hanging around my neck. Together they looked like some new run, but I couldn't read it. There was no sign of the golden web, no matter how hard I scrubbed. What had I been saying about going on fighting for the forces of good? In that mad little moment right after Con had said something comforting, that a vampire had seemed to say something comforting, should have told me I was having a crazy moment, not a returning sanity and hope moment. Going on doing anything like what I'd been doing these last five months, horribly culminating in what I had done last night, was approximately the last thing I wanted, especially when it meant bearing the knowledge of what I'd done, and that going on doing it would mean bearing more of doing and more of knowing. But Pat had said we had less than a hundred years left, us humans. No, not us humans, us on the right side, and there aren't enough of us. Okay, here's the irony. If I went on with this heavy magic handling shtick, I was likely to be around in a hundred years. I pulled the plug and started toweling myself dry. I rubbed violently at my hair like I was trying to friction burn undesirable thoughts out of my head. I washed and dried my little knife tenderly, however, and put it back in my fresh, clean, dry pocket. I was dressed in the first thing out of the top cupboard in the bathroom, where all my oldest, rattiest clothes lived. Then I started another bath and called Con. I found a one-size-fits-all kimono in the back of my closet that Con could get into, or rather that would go round him. At least it was black. I could give him the shirt in the back of my closet, but it wouldn't be long enough on him. Right. I was clean. Con had something to wear. On to the next thing, food. I didn't have to think any more long view thoughts yet. I still had small immediate things to organize myself around. I was frying eggs when he came out, looking very exotic in the kimono. I stood there holding a skillet with three beautifully fried eggs in it and said miserably, I can't even feed you. How I'd organized my entire life feeding other people. I heard what I was saying, or what I was saying it to, a moment after the words came out, but his gaze did not waver. I do not eat often. I do not need food. I shook my head. I'd narrowly avoided mental breakdown as a result of facing ancient, all-consuming evil, and now I was about to lose it over giving a vampire breakfast. I felt tears pricking at my eyes. This was ridiculous. I can't eat in front of you. It's so... I feed people for a living. If I don't do it, I'm a failure. I identify as a feeder of people, said Khan. I am not a person. I've just been having this conversation with myself in the bathroom. Yes, you are, I said. You're just not, you know, human. Your food grows cold, said Khan. It is better hot, yes. I shook my head mutinously. He was right, though. It was a pity to ruin such ravishing eggs. I will drink with you, said Khan. Orange juice, I said, hopefully. It had to have calories in it. Water didn't count. Very well, orange juice. I moved three white roses out of one of my nice glasses, gave it a quick wash, and poured orange juice in it. It was one of the tall ones with gold flecks, silly thing to drink juice out of. 
I didn't see him drink. It occurred to me I hadn't seen him drink his tea in the goddess's office either. But nearly half a gallon of orange juice disappeared while I ate my eggs and two toasted muffins and a scone. What a good thing that it hadn't occurred to me to empty my refrigerator before I died. Did that mean he liked it, or was this... Uh, his demanding standard of courtesy again. What does it taste like, I asked. It tastes like orange juice, he said, at his most enigmatic. How was I planning on putting us on the right side anyway? Khan had been on the right side as compared to Bo. Khan was still a vampire. He still... I did the dishes in silence while Khan sat in his chair. The kimono made him look very zen, sitting still doing nothing. I'd seen it first at the lake, that capacity for sitting still doing nothing with perfect grace. Although that wasn't how I'd thought of it when we were chained to the wall together. And it was interesting that he retained it when he wasn't under the prospect of immediate elimination, with no way out, which might be expected to focus the mind if it didn't blow it to smithereens. I did the dishes slowly. We'd done washing and eating. There wasn't anything to come except to figure out sleeping arrangements. Khan had acknowledged that vampires did something like sleep during the day, and my body had to have sleep soon or I was going to fall down where I stood, but my mind couldn't deal with it. I'd tried to convince myself to haul some laundry downstairs, but I couldn't face the effort. Stairs, the assault on Everest, and where were my Sherpas? I rescued Khan's trousers from where he had rinsed and wrung them out and draped them over the towel rack. You don't think of vampires in domestic chore terms, but I suppose even vampires have to come to some arrangement about getting their clothes washed, and hung them on the balcony for the sun and wind to dry them. At least they were still trousers, if a trifle ravaged by events, which was more than could be said for the remains of his shirt. I scuffled around in my closet again, at some peril to life and limb, since my calm gear tended increasingly to get left in there, and pulled the spare shirt out and left it on the closet doorknob. Every utensil was scoured within an inch of its life and dried and put away too soon. Sleep, no way. At least being this tired and still half watching my hands for renegade moves, I wasn't interested in. Or maybe I should say I wasn't capable of brooding about what else might happen in a bed-type situation, or could happen, or wasn't going to happen. I was capable of brooding about being afraid to be alone, afraid to sleep. You'll have to have the bed, I said. There are no curtains for the balcony, and the sun gets pretty much all around the living room over the course of the day. I'll sleep on the sofa. He was silent for a moment, and I thought he might argue. I'm not sure I wasn't waiting, hopefully, for an argument. But all he said finally was, very well. Of course I couldn't sleep. I would have liked to pretend, even to try to pretend, that it was because I wasn't used to sleeping during the day. But with the hours I sometimes kept at the coffee house, I had to have learned to take naps during the day or die. And I had learned to take naps. Up until five months ago, something or other or die had always seemed like a plain choice in favor of the something or other. Sleep was no friend today. Every time my heavy, aching eyes closed, some scene from the night before shot onto my private inner eye movie screen. And I prized them open again and lay dismally in the soft golden sunlight of early autumn, surrounded by the smell of roses. I don't know how long I lay there. I turned on my side so I could watch the sunlight lengthen across the tawny floor <clears throat> as the sun rose higher, as the light reached out to pat my piles of books, embrace the desk, stroke the sofa, draw its fingers tenderly across my face. I was comfortable and safe, safer than I'd been since before the night I drove out to the lake and met Con, 
Bo was gone, Bo and Bo's gang, but I couldn't take it in, or I couldn't take it in without taking in everything it had involved. We'd done it, Con and I. We'd done what we set out to do, and furthermore, what we'd known going in, we wouldn't be able to do. Or I had known we wouldn't be able to do it. What I hadn't known was that I'd been counting on not being able to do it, and I'd been wrong. We'd done it. Done is a very thumping sort of word. I felt like I was hitting myself with a club. I didn't feel safe. I felt as if I was still waiting for something awful to happen. No. I felt as if the thing I most dreaded had arrived, and it wasn't death after all. It was me. I'm afraid of you. I'm afraid of me. As little as three months ago, I thought that finding out I might be a part blood and might as a result go permanently round the twist once the demon gene met up properly with the magic handling gene was the worst thing that could happen. It was the worst thing I could imagine. I'd pulled the little paper protector of disuse off the baking soda packet of my father's heritage and dropped it into the vinegar of my mother's. The resultant, fifth and, the resultant fizz and seef, I believed, was going to blow the top of my head off. Now those fears seemed about as powerful as the kitchen bomb every kid has to make once or twice to fire popcorn at her friends. I felt as if mere ordinary madness would have been a reprieve. I'd known about the bad odds against part bloods with human magic handling in their background. I hadn't known anything about Bo, about what a thing like Bo could be. Black humor alert. And I still didn't know if my jeans were getting ready to blow the top of my head off, although it seemed to me they'd had the best opportunity any bad gene act could possibly have wanted and had let it pass them by. I wrapped the blanket closer around me and stood up and went into the bedroom. I'd drawn the curtains tightly together and the bed was in heavy shadow and I wasn't paying attention so it took me a moment to realize he wasn't in it. He couldn't have left. It was daylight out there. Panic rose up in me. I would have guaranteed I didn't have the energy for panic. One more thing to be wrong about. And what was I panicking about anyway? Being left alone with myself? I'd rather have a vampire around? Well, yes. I didn't have time to finish panicking. He stood up, or more like unfolded, like a particularly well-jointed extending ladder or something. Stood up doesn't really describe it, from the far side of the bed. What are you doing on the floor? He just looked at me, and I remembered the room I had once found him in. The room that wasn't his master's. At least he was still wearing the kimono. I'm sorry, I said. I can't sleep. Nor I, he said. So you do sleep, I said. I mean vampires sleep. We rest. We become differently conscious than when we are awake. I am not sure it is what you would call sleep. <clears throat> no, an orange juice probably doesn't taste like orange juice to you either, I thought. I couldn't sleep, but I was too tired to stand up. I sat down on the bed. I, we did it, you know, I said. But I don't feel like we did it. I feel like we failed. I feel like everything is worse now than it was before, or that I am. He was still standing. Yes, he said. Does it feel like that to you too? He turned his head as if he was looking out the window. Maybe he was. If I could see in the dark, maybe a vampire could see for curtains. Maybe it was something you learned to do after the first hundred years or so. One of those mysterious powers old vampires develop. I do not think in terms of better and worse. He paused so long I thought he wasn't going to say any more. It's probably an occupational hazard becoming a fatalist if you're a vampire. But he went on finally. What happened last night has changed us. Yes, inevitably. You have lived, what, one quarter of one century? I have existed many times that. Experience is less to me than it is to you, for I have endured much more of it. And yet last night troubles me too. I can a little guess how much more it must trouble you. I looked down, partly so he couldn't read anything in my eyes, although he probably already had. Maybe that was why he had been looking through the curtains. Vampire courtesy, previously observed. Troubled, I thought. Okay. Sunshine, he said. You are not worse. I looked up at him, remembered what I saw him do, remembered what I had seen myself do, remembered Bo. Tried to remember that we were the victors. Failed, if this was victory. 
I was so tired. I will do anything it is in my power to do for you, he said. Command me. A vampire standing on the far side of my bed, wearing my kimono, telling me he'd do anything I asked. Steady sunshine. I sighed. I wasn't up for it. I don't want to feel alone, I said. Lie down on the bed and let me lie down beside you and put your arms around me. I know you can't do anything about the heartbeat, but I know you can breathe like a human if you want to, so will you please? I looked at his face in the shadows, the shadows that lay motionless and fathomless across it, but it was expressionless, of course. He lay down and I lay down and he put his arms around me. Note, do vampire limbs get pins and needles and breathe like a human, more or less? It was a little hard to ignore the lack of heartbeat that close. No, you may not think you're aware of a pulse in the body lying next to you, barring your actual head on an actual chest, but trust me, you are. But he was the right temperature and that helped, and somehow the solidity of him, the fact that my open eyes could see nothing but his throat above the folds of the kimono and his jaw above that, felt strangely as if he was protecting me, as if he could protect me from what I had brought back with me, had roused to consciousness within me the previous night. I curled my deceitful hands under his chin, and I found myself falling asleep after all. I dreamed, of course. Again, Con and I were in Bo's lair, and there were vampires coming at us from all directions. Flame-eyed, deadly, horrible. Again, I saw Con do the things I would rather not have seen anyone do. Again, I did things myself I would rather not have done, nor know that I had done. It does not matter if it is them or us after a certain point. It does not matter. There are some things you cannot live with, with having done, even to survive. Again, my hands touched Bo's chest, plunged within it, grasped his heart, and tore it free. Watched it burn. Watched it deli deliquesce. And again, and again. I felt the poison of that contact sinking through my skin. It did not matter if it was only the poison of evil, the poison of an idea. It was corruption, and it corrupted me. I felt the fire of the golden web rise up in me, through me, and lift away. I wept in my sleep. When Bo caught fire and burned, I too burned. My tears left little runnels of fire down my face, not water. They dripped on my breast where the wound had reopened. They burned especially terribly there. My tears in the light web burned me and then left me. For a little while after this, I blew on the wind as if I were no more than ash, but I was blown eventually out of darkness into light, and as the light touched me, I began to take shape again. I struggled against this. I was fragments, bits of ash. I was nothing and no one. I had no self and no responsibilities. I did not want to be put back together again to face everything I was and had done and could do again. Another hundred years, tops, and the suckers are going to be running the show. The wars were just a distraction. I did not want to feel the poison eating through me again, to see those gangrenous lines crawling up my arms where the golden web had once run, toward my still beating heart, to see myself rotting. I would rather be ash, dry and weightless, without duty or care, or memory, or severed loyalties. Here was a memory. I was sitting on the porch of the cabin by the lake. It was night. I could hear behind me the ping of my car's engine as it cooled. It was a beautiful night. I was glad I had come. But my life was about to change irreversibly, irreparably. My death was about to begin. I listened for the vampires, knowing I would not hear them. It was too soon in the story of my death for me to hear them. Instead, I heard a light human step rustle in the grass and last year's half-crumbled leaves. I turned in amazement. My grandmother walked up the steps to the porch and sat down beside me. There was more gray in her hair than there had been 15 years ago. She looked worn and discouraged, but she smiled at me as I stared at her disbelievingly. 
I do not have much time, my dear, she said. Forgive me, but I had to come when I heard you weeping. When I understood what you wept for, she picked up my hands. And I gesture of very light cons and then held them together as she had done long ago when she had taught me to change a flower into a feather. Constantine is telling the truth, she said. There is nothing wrong with your hands. There is nothing wrong with you, except perhaps that you came into your strength too quickly and all alone, which is not how it should happen. If it is any comfort, this is not the first time it has happened this way to someone, and it will not be the last. And yet if it had not happened that way to you, you might not have done what you did, partly because you would have known it could not be done, and so you would have died. Would that have been so bad, I said, trying to keep my voice level? Mel would have mourned, and Emil and Mom and Charlie and Kenny and Billy, even Pat maybe, even Mrs. Bialski, but would it have been so bad? My grandmother turned her head to look out at the lake, and again I was reminded of Khan, of the way he turned his head to look through the curtains. She was still holding my hands. Would it have been so bad, she said musingly. I am not the one to answer that, for I am your grandmother and I love you. But yes, I think it would have been so bad. What we can do, we must do. We must use what we are given, and we must use it the best we can. However much or little help we have for the task. What you have been given is a hard thing, a very hard thing. Or you would not have to ask if your failure in early death would be so bad a thing to happen instead. But my darling, what if there were no one who could do the difficult things? Which difficult things, I said bitterly. There are so many of them. Right now it feels as if they're all difficult things. I waited for her to tell me to pull myself together and stop feeling sorry for myself. But she said, yes, there are many difficult things and they have been almost too much for you. Too much for you to have to bear it all at once. Remember what Constantine told you, that he too is shaken for all that he is older and stronger than you are. Khan is a vampire, I said. He's one of the difficult things. Yes, she said. I'm sorry. Pat says that we have less than a hundred years left, I said. And for a third time, she reminded me of Khan and the quality of the silence before her answer. But she sighed like a human. Pat is perhaps a little pessimistic, she said. A little, I said, a little. She said nothing. We sat there, her warm hands still holding mine. I was waiting for her to tell me everything was all right, that I would be better soon, that it would all go away, that I would be fine, that I would never have to look at another vampire again, that we had all the time we needed and it wasn't my battle anyway. She didn't. I heard the little noises that the lake water made. I felt the pieces of my severed loyalties grinding together of the fragments of me. I thought about the simplicity of dying. At last I said and surprised myself by the saying, I would be sorry never to see the sun again. I paused and realized this was true. I would be sorry never to make cinnamon rolls again or brownies or muffins or sunshine's eschatology. I would be sorry never to work 20 hours straight on a hot day in August and tear off my apron at midnight and swear I was going to get a job in a factory. I would be sorry never to leave my stomach behind when Mel opens the throttle on this week's rehab project. I would be sorry never to tell Mom to mind her own damn business again, never to have Charlie wander into the bakery and ask me if everything is okay when I'm in rabid bitch mode. Not to make it to Kenny and Billy's high school graduation, supposing either of them manages to graduate. I would be sorry never to reread Child of Phantoms again, never to argue with Emile about Le Fanu and M.R. James, never to lie in Yolandi's garden at high summer. Wonderingly, I said, I'd be sorry never to hear the latest SOF scuttlebutt from Pat again. I paused again longer this time. I almost didn't say it. I whispered. I would be sorry never to see Khan again, even if he is one of the difficult things. I woke with tears on my face and Khan's hair in my mouth. 
I don't think any of me moved but my eyelids, but he raised his head immediately. I sat up, releasing him from dreadful servitude. He rolled to his feet at once and drew the curtains back. Night had fallen. It's dark out, I said unnecessarily. Yes, he said. I didn't see him shed the kimono or walk out of the room, but suddenly he wasn't there, and the kimono was a black puddle on the dark floor. When he reappeared, he was wearing his own clothes. The black shirt looked much better on him than it had on me. The trousers looked pretty bad, but they were better than nothing. They had to be damp still, but I told myself he could raise his body temperature to steam them dry if he wanted to. Another of those little perks to being undead. He hadn't buttoned the shirt. There was no wound on his chest. I'd been here before, but there was a scar. I climbed off the bed, standing up a little dizzy, went to him, touched it. That's new, I said. Yes, he said. I wanted to know why. What would scar a vampire? And other vampires try for your heart? Or the touch of... The touch of... Human lips on such a wound, but I didn't ask. You slept, he said. I nodded. It is over. Last night is over, he said. And Bo is gone forever. I looked up at him. There was no expression on that alien, gray-skinned face. If it wasn't for the eyes, he could be a statue. One carved by a particularly lugubrious sculptor. Ludicrous, I thought. Insane, grotesque, grotesque impossible. I looked away so he couldn't read my eyes, but he'd said he could only read my fears, not my secrets. I would be sorry never to see Khan again. It is beginning to be over, I said. Last night is beginning to be over. I dreamed. I dreamed of my grandmother. She who taught you to transmute. Yes. He nodded as an articulated statue might, might nod, as if this made perfect sense. And as if this was, were the last perfect stroke and the story or the statue was complete. I wasn't going to cry. I wasn't. We are still bound, you and I, he said. If you call me, I will come. I shook my head, but he didn't say any more. You could call me, I said. Specters of the sort of black baker light phone fantasy that Khan's master might have tucked away in a corner gyrated briefly across my mind's eye. Yes, he said. I touched the new scar on my neck, the one that crossed the old scar, the one in the shape of a necklace. I have lost the chain you gave me. I'm sorry. I couldn't find the way even if you did call me. You have not lost it, he said. There was a pause. The necklace is still there. Oh, I said blankly. I suppose if a pocket knife can be transmuted into a, chi into a key, a chain can be transmuted into a scar. Maybe on the same grounds as that it's hard to leave your head behind because it's screwed on. Although it had been as well for Khan a little earlier that my pocket knife was still detachable. Carefully, I said, I would not want to call you if you did not want to come. Another pause, I bit my lip. I would want to come, he said. Oh, I said again. Pause. Would I? Do I need to be in danger of dying? I said. No, he said. But he turned his head and looked through the window as if he was longing to be gone. I stepped back. I took a deep breath. I thought of cinnamon rolls and Mel. I thought of trying to help save the world in less than a hundred years, doing it Pat's way. I'm sorry, I said. I'm trying to turn this into some kind of human goodbye thing, you know. You're free to go. I'm not human, he said. I'm not free. I'm not some kind of trap or jail cell, I said angrily. I'm not a rope around your neck or, or a shackle around your ankle. So, so go away. Perhaps it was the wind of my anger. I heard a rustle of leaves. He looked again at the window. I wrapped my arms around my body and leaned back against the end of the bed and stared at the floor, waiting for him to vanish. When do you again make cinnamon rolls? Gaping at him was getting to be a bad habit. So was saying what. I gaped at him. I said what. Patiently he repeated, When do you go again to your work of feeding humans? Or er, tomorrow morning, I guess. What time is it? 
It will be midnight in two hours, six hours then. I leave here a little after four. Slowly, as if he were an archaeologist deciphering a fragment of a long dead language. He said, you could come with me tonight. I would return you here in time for your leaving to go to the preparation of cinnamon rolls. If you are sufficiently rested, if you wish to come. What does a vampire actually do at night? Go for long invigorating walks, research the habits of badgers and owls, and er, I wasn't very up on my nocturnal wildlife. Aren't you er hungry? Another pause. Time enough for me to decide I'd imagine what he'd just said. I am hungry, he said. I am not so hungry that I cannot wait six hours. I thought of how totally horribly difficult tomorrow was going to be. I thought of all the stories I was going to have to tell. I thought of all the truth I was going to have to not tell. I thought of lying to Charlie, to Mel, to Mom, to Mrs. Bialski and Maud, to Emil, even to Yolandi. I thought of facing Pat again. I thought of having to talk to the goddess again, among other things, about the disappearance of Mr. Connor, whose address would turn out to be false. I thought of how much easier all these things would be. If Khan vanished into the night now forever, they wouldn't be easy. Nothing was ever going to be completely easy again after last night. And I hated lying. I had been lying so much lately. Almost everything would be easier if Khan went away forever. Khan said, I would rather bury your company a few more hours than slake my hunger. I didn't make up my mind. I heard my voice say, I'll get dressed. I turned like a walking statue a badly made puppet, and went to the closet. I managed to turn the knob and open the door before my brain caught up with me. By that time, the decision had already been made. Since my living room closet was now full of calm gear, my bedroom closet was impassable. Where, or for that matter when, had I last seen my black jeans? As I say, I don't do black, and my wardrobe isn't based on the concept of dematerializing into the shadows. This may take a minute, I said. I hoped I didn't sound like I was begging. I will not leave without you, he said. His voice was so expressionless, and I could not see him now as I was, on my knees on the floor of my closet, fumbling through a pile of laundry that might have stayed folded if it had had a shelf to go on, but it didn't and it hadn't. Maybe it was because I was thinking about self-unfolding laundry that made it so easy to hear that he was telling the truth. I will not leave without you. I looked at my hands, the hands that had touched Bo and held his heart while it melted and ran stinking down my wrist and dripped sizzling to the disintegrating floor in which were now efficiently sorting wrinkled laundry. I saw my hands clearly, although it was dark, because I could see in the dark, and they did not look wrong or strange or corrupt to me. They looked like my hands. Deeper in the closet, where were those damn jeans, where it was really very dark, and while I was thinking about jeans, I saw the faintest glimmer of gold on the backs of them, on the backs of my hands and on my forearms. I had not lost the light web either. This was now my life, cinnamon rolls, sunshines, eschatology, seeing in the dark, charms that burned into my flesh where I could not lose them, a special relationship with the special other forces, where not everybody was on the same side. A landlady who's a wards keeper, untidy closets, vampires. Get used to it, sunshine. I came out of the closet wearing black jeans and a charcoal gray t-shirt I had always hated, and red sneakers. Hey, red turns gray in the dark faster than any other color. He held out his hand. Come then, he said. I went with him into the night.